Our scripture this morning comes from Acts 13, verses 17 through 23. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then, with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the desert. Then he destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land of it to Israel as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin who reigned for 40 years. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And, and it is the one of King's da King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. The word of God. Thanks be to God. So this is a, uh, a new series that I'm beginning called The Gospel of David, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to be doing this. Uh, and, and the reason why is uh, I have never taught on David in a series before, and it was really kind of almost by, by accident. Um, as I was looking at the gospel readings that we do for normally for Christmas, um, I kind of did an investigation when I started looking at David's life and realized I want to do a series on, on this man, and now's the time. There are more texts in the Bible written about David than almost any other person beside Jesus Christ. We know that he is mentioned 59 times in the New Testament. And that passage, I'm talking about the gospel passage we read at Christmas, is this says, when the angels or visit, visit these shepherds, and they said, for unto you this day a Savior is born in the city of where? David. I found that very interesting. Why is that? And when I began to kind of re investigate, you notice that Jesus is very seldom ever called the son of Moses or the son of Abraham. He's repeatedly over and over again called the son of David. And what this tells me is if the Bible thinks that David is important, then it must tell us that we must know he's important and why he's important. And what I would kind of tell you, if, if we do not understand, this is what I've kind of come to realize as I was kind of looking, going forward in the next several months, if we do not understand who David is and was, I don't think we have a complete picture of who Jesus Christ is. And so if the Bible says he's important, we must understand why he's important. And I would also add here, we actually get a glimpse into who David was when he was at his best. When he was at his best is when God seemed to use him the most. And I want to ask the question this morning, looking at this, why did, why did God handpick David? above all else. And to understand why God handpicked him, we must understand what preceded before David came along. And let me put a picture up here, famous painting of, of Saul and David. When David was in Saul's court playing music for him, Saul was the anointed king. And that is for centuries and many, many years, God's people kept asking, begging God for a king. God did not want to give them a human king because he knew they were flawed. But they kept asking and asking and asking. And sometimes the worst thing that God prophecy could allow and some of the worst curses God could ever give is to God give us what we ask for. How many times have we prayed for something that we look back and we say, I am so glad he did not answer that prayer. Because I've said, I would have been married to the wrong person two times, right? <laughs> right? There's a reason why Jesus teaches us and taught us we pray for thy will be done instead of our will. And yet God gave them Saul. And Saul was not a good king. He reigned for a long time, but he was not a good king. And it says, because you have not kept the Lord's command, God removed him. And let me put the passage up here that John just read a little while ago there in Acts. That is taken right out of the first chapter or the 13th chapter from 1 Samuel. Paul's basically quoting it there. And he's basically saying here, God removed Saul and replaced him with David. And why did he do that? It was because Saul was not a righteous king. Saul was not someone who was following God. And the Bible upholds David 
is an incredible model of what to do and what not to do, as we're going to see. But the key to all this is, I want to underscore this up here, God says to him, about David, I have found my man. And why? He's a man after my own heart. He truly wants to know me. He truly wants to glorify me. He wants to let the world know who I am. Now, let me add here. Let's not get our stories mixed up here. Okay. David was as flawed as Saul was. And we're going to see in a little bit why we can never put a human being over anybody. Especially over God. Yet the Bible upholds David as this incredible model. Why? Why does he uphold David almost above everybody else? Well, I'm glad you asked, okay? Because the biblical precedent is, we see this over and over and over again, that God seems to use and to choose complicated people. People that do not have it all together. And what David's life has taught me well, almost as much as anybody in the Bible is this, and I'll put this, it's the first point up here, the measuring stick for God is the heart. That's God's measuring stick. God looked inside and he saw David's heart. And he knew that David truly loved him. And this is the great difference between Saul and David, the huge difference. Saul was doing what was best for Saul. Saul was very much wanted to have people have a high opinion of himself. In other words, everything Saul did was to bring glory to himself. Everything David did was to bring glory to God. David was constantly trying to point people to God. And David cared about how God saw him. That's abundantly clear now as I've gone through the, looking through the series. The fact that David was so distraught and so undone when he realized how much he had screwed up his life with Bathsheba. And that he actually had a man killed. He barely could go on living because he knew how much he disappointed God. Saul was only upset that he was caught. <laughs> Which describes a lot of us, right? But David was upset that God was disappointed with him. He was heartbroken about it. And what I want you to know is that the fact that God chose David and chooses complicated me, uh, people means God is not looking for perfect men and, men and women. God is looking for hearts that are devoted to him. And church, I got to tell you, that is good news, is it not? That God chooses us. Look at us. <laughs> he chooses to use us. And no matter how much we mess up, we can always come home. That's the great story of the prodigal. It doesn't matter how much or how low we go, God always is saying, come home. It's what I love about having GPSs on my phone. For someone who loses my direction all the time, it doesn't matter how far I go off the beaten path. I can end up in the middle of nowhere. All I got to do is get on my, put some apps and push home, and it will lead me home. Your grace has brought me safe thus far. And praise God, that same grace is going to lead me home. So God's measuring stick is the heart. The second thing I'll put up here is this, is that we see this in David's life, and that character is still king. Now and always, character is everything in God's eyes. And it's why he chose David and also why he exposed David because of his great love for him. And I got to tell you, being in ministry now for 25 plus years, that has been something that has stood above everything and that character is more important than almost anything. And I'll tell you, I just go, you know, I remember as I've often talked about Dr. Keller, what he, remember he taught us this and I remember him saying this many, many times. He said, you know, he was, he's right there in the heart of Wall Street. He's got several people work for Fortune 500 companies. He said, I've watched companies, I've watched governments, I've watched, especially when anybody else, churches make the same mistake over and over and over and over again. It doesn't matter how much I tell them, they still do it. That is, we place competence over character all the time. 
We do it in sports. We do it in politics. We do it in government. We do it in business. Character is everything. And you can't fake good character. You, there's no substitute for it. And you could hide behind a facade for a while, but at some point, your private life is going to catch up with your public one, and they're going to intercede. And who are you? Who are you? And see, this is the thing that, uh, that God saw about David. He saw inside his heart. And David's taught me this above everything else, is that we are not called to be successful in all things. We are called as God's people to be faithful in all things. Huge. And that's the thing here. It's our faithfulness, not our competency, that seems to please God. Which is why I, what I love about this book and why he chose David and why he chooses us is that God can choose anybody. He chooses seven-year-old children. He chooses 90-year-olds. He chooses people with dyslexia to preach sermons every week. He chooses anybody. And God says to David, listen, you used to lead sheep. And sheep used to follow you. I am now placing my hand on you. Well, you're now going to be leading men and women. And they're going to be following you. And David, you're not doing any of these things for me. You're doing these things through me. For my glory. The other thing that stands out is that David was constantly trying to point people to God. That's the thing that's so key about his life. He was always trying to reflect and point people to God. To point people to him. And I want to add here, when God, when he is our king, and not a man, then we will never go astray. We will never go wrong. Man-made kings will let you down. I cannot stress this enough. I say this as truthfully as I can, okay? People will let you down. Pastors will let you down. Churches will let you down. Politicians will let you down. Your own family will let you down. God never will. All those entities I just mentioned can never deliver what only God can, what the Lord can. Which brings us to this last point up here, and that is that we long for a true king. This is what this points to here in, in, in the entirety of David's life, and especially in the passage that was read earlier. And you may wonder, what, what do you mean by that? Well, the truth is we were meant and designed to be ruled, to follow someone greater than ourselves. And C.S. Lewis makes a very astute observation. In 1943, he wrote a paper uh, that he was published called Equality. And at the time, and still, it's amazing here, 80 years later, it's still the same thing, that people are constantly banging on monarchy and saying, why do we have it? Let's get rid of it. And he was arguing. He said he wasn't arguing one way or the other to keep it or not, you know, to have it or to, keep, you know, not have it. What he said is that we are built as human beings to follow monarchy. And so if you get rid of monarchy here, you will just pick it up somewhere else. We always follow something else. And if you, if you, this does not seem obvious to you, let me give you some pictures to kind of show you this. Let me put this picture, these pictures up here of how we follow man-made people, man-made entities. We watch this in business. We watch this in sports. Have we not seen this in politics? Hero worship, godlike status, doesn't matter what the person does, they never do anything wrong. And I watched, I, I don't know if you, I watched the World Cup. I was really into it. And when Lionel Messi won the World Cup, the front of the, one of the Spanish newspapers said, Messi is God. Or let me take this a step further. Growing up in the South, I certainly know this, okay. In my family, there was no clear line between religion and college football, Okay. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So I watched this past Monday the national championship and the just demolition that <laughs> Georgia placed on TCU. And I don't think Georgians have seen a demolition like that since Sherman marched through Atlanta, right? <laughs> but 
when Stetson Bennett, who accounted for six touchdowns, was coming off the field, the Georgia fans, guess what they were doing? Some of you saw it. Bowing down. Now, maybe it's meant to be funny, but I, I don't know. You watch this. We worship athletes, rock stars, movie stars, even gangsters. We honor billionaires. If we reject monarchy, we will, we will just pick it up somewhere else. And, and the question is, why is there such a deep-seated need to crown something psychologically, sociologically, or even culturally? And the simple answer is, and this may seem odd, is God designed us like this to make us want to look to something to lead us, to rule us, that we may follow after it. In other words, we are built to serve something. But here's the thing. If it's not God, it's going to be something else. And let me just give you this quote. And this is just pure gold right out of the Bible that proves this point up here. Look what it says in here in Romans. I want to put it up here. People said that they were wise, but they became fools. They traded the glory of God who lives forever and get this, for the worship of idols made to look like earthly people. <laughs> Paul nails it when he writes that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our spiritual nature is just like our physical one. We have to eat or we will die. And if, if we are not eating the bread of heaven, what Lewis said is we will gobble up poison from somewhere else. We're going to serve something, and we can deny it all we want, but God made us like this. And what I would suggest to you, it's a memory trace of a collective unconscious since the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden when we were walking with God in the cool of the evening hand in hand where everything was perfect, and we were relying on him when we were following him, and we've lost that. That's the reason we chase after all these other things. We lost that. And we long to have that again. We long for a dependence of a king of glorious splendor, undimmed since the breaking of the world. And this reason why, by the way, we recite this in our liturgy here. You, you, you've said it. You, you've said it before. We remember, we remember his death. What? We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. Or we're going to sing a little bit. Christ has died. Hello? Christ is what? Risen. Christ will, okay, you passed, okay, you could, well done. God made us. He designed us to follow after some, something so much larger than just any man-made monarchy. We long for a king. We long to be ruled. And I would even say even higher than that, David's life points to something even greater. And this is... This is insanely cool, what I'm going to show you next, okay? So let me put this passage up. This is out of 1 Samuel chapter 16, where Samuel, the prophet, is just distraught about Saul and how much he's let down. He also looked to man-made monarchy. And God says, you've got to get over this. You've got to quit mourning over this man. I have had, I am placing my hand on somebody else. And this is what he says. I have rejected Saul as a king of Israel, so I want you to fill, fill your flask with oil, olive oil, and go to where? Go to Bethlehem, because I have a king there that I have chosen. Where have we heard that before? Do you know? You don't have to be a theologian to know this. There was another story of another king in Bethlehem. It was the foretelling of the coming of Jesus Christ. And when I was, just this past week, I was thinking about this. It reminded me of when I was teaching my C.S. Lewis class, something G.K. Chesterton said, gosh, 80, 90 years ago. He was asking the question to parents, why do parents still read fairy tales to their children, especially ones that have stories of, of monsters and dragons in them? Why do, why do we read those? And he goes, do we read them because we're trying to teach our children that dragons and monsters are true? No, that's not why we read them. He goes, you don't have to teach children. He said, if you never read a fairy tale and you never read a story that didn't have any monsters and any dragons in them, children will already believe in them anyway, and they will have them under their bed. You don't have to teach them that. He said, the reason why we read these fairy tales to, is to children 
is to teach them that the dragon can be slain, that the monsters can be defeated, that evil can be put down. Because let's face it, we, we look around the world and we see evil in every direction. He said, you've got to teach children that evil can be defeated. That's why we do it. And he said, and this points really to the gospel. Because David was pointing to someone greater. And David was basically saying, in essence of his life, things may look bad now. And there may be great suffering. And you and I, he actually wrote, you and I, we are going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will do it with tears in our eyes, but we are following after a shepherd. And he's, he's basically saying here, there will become, there is one coming in the future that is going to crush the serpent, that's going to slay the dragon. There's one coming in the future that's going to put down suffering and evil and even death itself. But in the process of it, of crushing evil, he's going to receive a mortal wound. He's going to die because of it. But David's saying, in essence, he will be our great champion. He will be our hero. He will be our great captain. What do you and I expect from a king? I would dare say a true king, a true king is someone who has the ability to put down and defeat evil. A true king is willing to lay down his life for his kingdom and all those who reside in it. A great and mighty king is a king who's able to see the gold in each one of us and make it shine. The greatest king in history, okay, King Jesus, has taken us to a higher place that's more beautiful and more powerful and the more glorious than any of us can possibly imagine. And the, here's the thing that I think is so amazing. Our great captain has invited us to follow after him. And following him has, of course, always been the essential point. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you this morning, and we remember again the words of David who said, so many years ago, if we follow after you, if we take your hand and we follow you, our great shepherd, your word says, and we claim and believe that your goodness and your mercy will follow after us all the days of our lives as we look forward to that day we dwell in your house with you forever. It's in your name we ask and pray these things. Amen. Let's stand together and recite the Nicene Creed.